Uh, nevertheless, um, we have introduced two separate languages. One is the form language, uh, which uh, has to do with uh, tectonics, with uh, dimensions and sizes and shapes of components. How big are the windows? Are they going to be uh, horizontal strips? Are they going to be square? Are they going to be uh, vertical type windows? What is the aspect ratio of the rectangle of the windows? Are they going to be frames? How wide is the frame? Uh, compared to the uh, window opening, uh, are there going to be uh, subdivisions? Are there going to be mountains and mullions in the glass? Um, don't think that I'm talking about 18th century architecture. I'm reopening all possibilities for form languages. I'm telling the students in my course that everything is open for innovation. Anything that has been used uh, in the past centuries that can be used today uh, as a form language is open. Uh, anything that you can think of that can be used uh, in a form language, innovative form language, is open. But there is one criterion. There's a basic criterion which w is inviolate as far as, as uh, this uh, uh, theory is concerned. Namely, the, the built environment using a particular form language has to be healing to the users. It has to uh, satisfy physiolog physiological and psychological well-being. And now, in the last few years, we can measure that. It's no longer a person's opinion or an architect's opinion uh, or even an architectural critic's opinion, okay? We can measure it um, uh, by um, uh, using uh, uh, techniques and, and sensors developed in the medical profession. So. With that inviolate condition, then everything is open. So um, you don't have to use um, horizontal strip windows just because someone says you do. Why? You choose your own windows. Um, just, just make sure if you do something that has been not been used in the past, that you run some, some tests and see that it is not uh, 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 anxiety inducing. If it's anxiety inducing, it is absolutely forbidden to use in an adaptive architecture. Of course, you can use it, but then you be uh, you are aware that you're doing something against humanity and against nature in order to make a buck, and uh, that is not a very nice thing to do. Okay, so, you know, you can do it. There are people who do things to make money that they know are no good for humanity, but they do it anyway. So, as long as you're aware of it. Um, uh, in discussions with my students uh, this year, this semester that I'm teaching the course, I have, I have noticed uh, two things, uh, and those are both good, good things. Um, uh, the students, some of the students have have uh, suddenly realized that this course is liberating, and it confirms their intuitions about things. So they have stated in the essays that are part of, of the course of those students who are taking it, they have stated that they felt uneasy about certain things that were prevalent in, in that are prevalent in, in architecture today or were taught in other courses and they didn't agree with them, but they bowed to authority. And now they see in this course that their original intuition was indeed correct. Those are anxiety inducing typologies, form languages. So that is liberating. Uh, at the same time, there is a little bit of alarm for the same reason, that uh, what some students had been taught by the media as being very good architecture or in other uh, aspects of their uh, learning from architecture books uh, turns out to be not good architecture. So th this questions authority. Well, it is my intention in this course to teach students to question authority and dig down to see if something that's proposed as good architecture is in fact good for the users, for the health of the users, the well-being, the psychological well-being of the users. That is the ultimate uh, criterion, and it can be uh, it can be measured. Uh, let us uh, ask the environmental psychologist, uh, psychologists, and doctors to measure it, or uh, a student can actually uh, uh, try to measure these things by, by him or herself. The tools are available now. So don't take anything for granted. 
um, don't take something that could be a personal whim of some architect and just repeat it. Question everything. I, I know this, this opens up uh, a great deal of uncertainty in a student who has been um, up until now uh, accepting some uh, typologies and ways of, of design as, uh, as standard. Well, some things have become standard that are not very good, that are in fact terrible. So um, uh, hopefully uh, with the exercises that we're going to do uh, in the next uh, uh, three weeks uh, with uh, innovative form languages, uh, you will uh, gain a, an unprecedented uh, independence and uh, innovation that has been uh, denied. Um, it is curious, I don't want to accuse uh, uh, several generations of colleagues, uh, but form languages, of course, are not taught uh, as a regular part of the curriculum. Uh, form languages are reduced to the most uh, simplistic expression, and they're called a style. But that's not in order to teach a form language. It is to sort of destroy the complexity of the form language, to reduce it to what is called a style, and then to attack and condemn that style by associating it with a certain period. Okay, so what has been done uh, up until now is to, is to uh, just reduce the form language. Don't, don't teach the complexity of a form language. Don't teach the inno innovative qualities. Uh, the possibilities of, of form language. Don't, don't teach that to students, but uh, sort of take one form language that was used, say this is a style which denies the complexity of that form language, and then condemn that style by saying, well, this style was used in this age, and therefore it's I irrelevant for today, and uh, it should be forbidden to be used today, because today we are uh, moderns, uh, we are in 2021, so it is forbidden to use uh, from uh, a style from the past. So this is very negative. It, it does not, uh, it, it restricts, it totally restricts the student's creativity. It restricts the, the designer's uh, creativity. Uh, it's really very, very uh, 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 restrictive and, and damaging to the, to the whole field of architecture. Um, the readings that, uh, that we have, uh, that we have had, um, tell you that Alexander uh, is approaching this um, uh, test of uh, spaces, uh, surfaces, configurations, designs that are uh, good for the users. And so for want of a better word, Alexander says this, pla this place here, this corner here, this uh, window here has life, in quotation marks. What does that mean? Well, Alexander means it uh, to imply that uh, we have a connection. Uh, the, the user who is experiencing this uh, real time, you know, more than a photograph, you're there, you're experiencing uh, this portion of, of, the, of the built environment. And if it's good, if it is well designed in, in the sense of this course, not uh, contemporary uh, flashy design, in the sense of this course, then you feel a kinship to it. You feel a kinship, the same kinship that you feel towards a, a friendly animal, a cat, your pet dog, uh, a plant, a, a nice, a nice uh, a bush, a flower, a tree that you're standing next to it. So this kinship to actual biological life is um, duplicated uh, and, uh, and uh, mimicked by uh, uh, those uh, pieces of the environment that are designed and are totally artificial, they're man-made, that are designed and you feel a kinship to them. This is what I'm trying to, to say, and, and Alexander is, is trying to say, uh, is the goal of the healing architecture, that, that you feel this very positive uh, kinship to um, uh, environments that have life. And uh, uh, the, the goal of the course is, is to give the, the tools to the students to create an environment that has this life, because that's not usually um, uh, 
uh, the, the, the goal of design over the past several uh, decades. Uh, the, the goals of design uh, instead have been a very, some abstract notions, intellectual notions. That, that's not what we're talking about at all here. Uh, now, uh, the, the, um, the, the fact that um, uh, one place possesses a certain degree of life and another place uh, possesses a different degree of life is felt, but it is not a personal opinion. Uh, Alexander himself did numerous studies and found a remarkable consistency of uh, different people who express uh, uh, their feeling that a particular place has a high degree of life. And same people, large number, agree that the different place has a lower degree of life or very, very low degree of life. So these are not personal opinions. Um, uh, architects have become used to to a dismissing something that could be universal by someone saying, well, this is just personal opinion. Well, no, some things are personal opinion and others are not. And the only way to find out which is which is to perform uh, scientific experiments, apply the scientific method. Unfortunately, architecture students are not science students. They're not taught the scientific method. So I, I'm teaching that to my students. All it takes is 30 seconds. I will explain it to you. The scientific method, you want to study a certain phenomenon, okay, a certain effect. So you make a conjecture. You say, if I do this, this will happen. In this case, you make a conjecture. It could be a reasonable conjecture, it could be a wild conjecture, it doesn't matter. Then you think, how I can, can I test it? Okay, uh, do I make a mock-up of, of different similar situations and then have a group of 12 friends look at the different mock-ups and um, um, each one independently and secretly writes down the, the ranking, you know, from, from zero to 10. It's, it is one way to do it. Uh, and then you, you will see that you can test your, your conjecture about uh, things that have an immediate impact on design and architecture. So this is a simple way. Uh, there are other ways. Uh, uh, people with access to, to uh, medical sensors can see if the body is reacting with alarm. Uh, uh, does a certain uh, uh, configuration uh, create anxiety in the user? That's, that's a red flag that you should not build this. Uh, or if it has been built, don't build it again. Certainly not make it a reproducible typology, as often happens. Um, so um, the idea of, of using the scientific method to distinguish what's bad from good, well, that makes the entire architecture profession extremely uneasy. They don't want to distinguish between what's bad uh, from what is good based on the scientific method. They would prefer to follow certain typologies uh, as given by famous architects. Well, maybe this famous architect knows what he or she is doing, or maybe they don't. Um, don't trust authority. I mean, don't trust the authority of a person who says something just because they're famous. We trust the authority of the scientific method, which enables us and has enabled the world to progress, okay? So we trust that authority. Whereas the world has trusted individuals that have led it to disaster. So let's be careful to, to, uh, to see who we trust. Um, I mentioned the, the pattern language, uh, and we have uh, just two readings uh, on the pattern language. There are two books available. The original a book, a collection of patterns called A Pattern Language by Christopher Alexander and his uh, colleagues uh, that was published in 1977. It's still relevant today. Everything is relevant. Maybe two or three patterns out of 235 are outdated, but the rest are relevant. Uh, what are patterns? Uh, patterns um, join social behavior of humans to geometries. So it is not strictly geometry like the form language. A pattern is, is an observation over time of, of a certain a design solutions that make it easy to use something, that make something attractive, that make, say, a window, a door, 
uh, a plaza, an urban plaza, a street, a sidewalk. Sometimes uh, it is possible to give dimensions, something like codes, but codes uh, can be right or wrong and, and uh, nobody tests them. But the patterns have been uh, measured and obtained from those places all around the world that are the most wonderful uh, in, uh, in use by, by different uh, people. So you have, you have a pattern that occurs in different parts of the world, which means that it is culture independent, which means also that when, once it is documented in either of these two books, the pattern language of uh, Alexander and then the new pattern language by Mahaffey and other people, including myself, then you have saved yourself, uh, say, a, a month or two of research because you just look up the pattern. It is two pages. You read it. You say, ah, this is uh, relevant to what I'm designing. So you apply the pattern and you have a certain percentage guarantee of success. Well, it's not going to guarantee total success because there are other factors in your design that, that you need to take into account. But the more patterns that you can apply uh, to your uh, project, then uh, uh, the closer you are being pushed uh, towards uh, a success. The success in, in the sense that the user will feel really wonderful and will want to use it if you're designing an office. The person who works there most of the day will, will uh, like it and they will not get sick all the time. Uh, so, so this is the... Um, uh, this is the goal of, of adaptive design. Uh, now, uh, most people uh, don't don't have a course in pattern language. That's unfortunate. Uh, it's, it's not my problem. It is a problem of of the uh, architectural education all over the world that do not teach uh, uh, two semesters of pattern languages. But my students in this course at least got the mention of the pattern language and uh, all of half an hour discussion. So if, uh, if in the future they, they feel attracted to use a pattern language, they know where to go. Either one of them, well, they should go through both of these two books, leaf through them, see which patterns uh, are applicable to their project and see, see if they can apply uh, the patterns. Uh, and uh, if, if, there is, if there is a pattern that's crucial to your project that you don't find, well, you have to derive it yourself. And we have given, my, my friends and I have given uh, uh, descriptions of how one goes to derive a pattern that you need that has not been uh, derived and documented already by, uh, in the two existing books. So, uh, you know, the, the framework is there, the structure is there, uh, uh, and also uh, it's open to, to innovation. Le namely, if you need a new pattern that's not there, you, you, can, you can derive it. You don't invent a pattern, you discover it. So, I, I do want to make a, uh, a, a beginning statement about form languages. You can be totally innovative in the form language, but it has to be complex. It's like a spoken language, okay? If it's too simplistic, it is not a language. It's a series of grunts. It's, it's a language that's a non-language. It's, 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 it's a below human language. You cannot really communicate uh, advanced concepts in a non-language. Uh, so there are two ways to, to see if your language is complex enough. The first one is just the size of the language. Okay, what, how big is the vocabulary? I'm not going to say anything about that because we're going to discuss that at great length later. The second one, though, is relevant uh, to this week's uh, discussion. Namely, uh, the, the form language has to be complex enough to blend in with the patterns. Because when you design something, you have the form language on the one hand and the pattern language on the other. The pattern language is inviolate because it is, uh, it is discovered from examples that work. So you, don't, you cannot mess with the pattern language. You can pick the patterns that are relevant, but you don't mess with the pattern language, okay? It, it is there. The form language you can change. It's up to you. You're an innovative architect, you can change the form language. But eventually you will have to blend them together and they have to work together. Now, if you come up with an innovative form language and then you try to mix it with the patterns and they don't blend, uh-uh, that's a red flag, something is wrong. 